Hi everybody, Mike Jarek here and welcome to another edition of the Jarek Report. It's a chance for me to showcase some of the talent and creativity of my co-workers here at Fox 29. Uh, the report basically consists of stories that we all find interesting and hopefully you will too. First up tonight is something we call hidden in plain sight where we fly drones over places that you don't normally see. Tonight, we feature the Eastern State Penitentiary. I know, I know what you're saying. It's a tourist attraction. It's in plain sight. Thousands of people go in there at Halloween to scare the heck out of themselves. Well, there are places inside the prison that are off limits. So we're gonna take a look at them. Courtesy of our flying bills, Bill Rohr and Bill Anderson, our drone pilots. They take us to places inside the prison that tourists don't normally see. A hidden in plain sight is not something that you would normally say about one of the most popular tourist attractions in our area. People are often impressed by the architecture, the scale of the building. Uh, some people are not sure if it's authentic or not. And I think once they realize like this place was the real deal, this was a real prison where real people were incarcerated, it's a, sh a perspective shift for people. But in the case of the Eastern State Penitentiary in the Fairmount section of Philadelphia, it applies because although there are daily tours and during the holiday season, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people on the site, the history of the location isn't as widely known as some of the tourist attractions. We are a stabilized ruin here at Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, our conservation philosophy is that we're going to save the building from deterioration, kind of freeze it in time and do limited restoration. Once again, the team of yours truly, Bill Anderson, and photojournalist Bill Rohr wanted to get inside and share with you some of the history, but also some of the off-limits areas that most aren't allowed to experience. This is one that wouldn't really be safe for mainstream visitation yet. Our tour guide was more than happy to oblige, starting by explaining to us the reasoning behind Eastern State. Eastern State's often called the world's first true penitentiary. Uh, is a building designed to inspire penitents. And how they actually became a model for other prisons across the country. So that meant 23 hours a day alone in a cell. And this was done in an effort to rehabilitate prisoners, to make them reflect on their crime, to go through a, a transformative experience, and go back into society less likely to break the law. But they also don't sugarcoat the fact that there's a definite conflict among visitors between the architectural beauty of the structure and what we now know to be, by today's standards, the inhumane treatment that some of the prisoners received over time. The building has no, almost no air conditioning in the cell blocks and the air conditioning. Uh, it must have been stiflingly hot. The cells are mostly stone and metal. It can be an oven here in the summer. And then it's also excruciatingly cold here in the winter. But even so, there's a lot to learn walking through Eastern State Penitentiary from the well-known occupants. Uh, we've recreated Al Capone's cell based on a couple of newspaper articles that were published while he was incarcerated here from 1929 to 1930. And those articles describe Al Capone's cell as, quote, very comfortable. To the highly publicized escapes. Willie Sutton, who's one of the great bank robbers of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. He was part of an elaborate tunnel escape uh, in the spring of 1945. To how recently the prison was actually still in operation. Some people actually think the, the deterioration is a Disneyland effect, that it's too dramatic. They like, kind of connect the dots mentally. They say, oh, it closed in 71, and then you open in the 90s. Like, there's no way it could have happened that fast. Um, but it's not. This is, uh, this is just what happens when Mother Nature decides to take a building back. The hidden part of the tour was equally interesting, even being less well known. The initial CK, and we think that's Clarence Kleindienst, architect of the 1945 tunnel escape, which was known as the Willie Sutton tunnel escape for a long time. Now, thankfully for me, and maybe a little disappointing for Bill Rohr, we acknowledged the belief in paranormal activity on the site, but we decided not to stay overnight to investigate it. Eastern State has a, a, a major reputation as possibly one of the most haunted buildings in the United States, maybe the world. This was a very real place where people went through some profound suffering. Almost 1,500 people 
passed away here. The Eastern State Penitentiary is right there in the middle of a highly populated, largely entertainment-based community, and yet it still remains a mystery to some. And so the next time you go by, take a moment to try to better understand the history, the impact it's made on the prison industry, and the more than just tourist value, and you'll get perhaps a better idea of why such a high profile building actually remains hidden in plain sight. Coming up next on the Jarek Report, the ship's in, well, it's always in. Welcome back to the Jarek Report. This next story takes us to South Philadelphia. In fact, it's down by the Ikea store. I'm sure you've seen that giant ship docked in the Delaware River. It's the USS United States. And did you know that 70 years after its first launch, it still holds the record for the fastest trip by a cruise ship across the Atlantic? Photojournalist Pete Santo has her story and her history. She's one of a kind, an American original. It's an engineering marvel. Many say really the greatest ship this country ever produced. Christen the SS United States. In 1951, at a cost of over $79 million, she left Newport News, Virginia, to her port of registry, New York City. The ship's designer, William Francis Gibbs, a native of Philadelphia, grew up dreaming of designing the fastest ship in the world a feat that was achieved on her maiden voyage to the United Kingdom. She set the record using only two-thirds of her power, so we don't even know how fast she could have gone. William Gibbs' granddaughter wants the SS United States history preserved so generations from now people won't forget what an engineering marvel this vessel is. She just symbolized the nation's post-war strength, resilience, greatness. In 1969, with air travel becoming a faster and more efficient way to get across the Atlantic, the giant boat was withdrawn from service. After numerous ownership changes and being completely stripped of her Art Deco themed interior over the years, she made her way up the Delaware River towards Philadelphia. The SS was so tall, a portion of its mast had to be removed so it could fit under the Walt Whitman Bridge. The SS United States has called South Philadelphia home since 1996 here on Pier 82. It's a whopping 175 feet tall and almost 1,000 feet in length. It's been dormant for 25 years. Can anything be done to bring this ship back to its glory? We think the SS United States is an amazing candidate for revitalization. There is 500,000 square feet of usable space, so she could be an amazing mixed-use museum and development complex. Currently, the ship is owned by the SS United States Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization founded in 1992. It costs $60,000 a month to dock the ship here in Philadelphia. It's a group that was formed to save the SS United States for posterity. Frank DiGiulio is on the board of the Conservancy and he's hopeful that they can have her preserved so that future generations can see what a technological and artistic achievement it is. We have a partner in New York, RXR Realty, and they're doing everything they can to try to redevelop this ship. So what to do now with her as she sits waiting? As you walk through, the once grand ballroom is completely empty, but being inside, you can feel the energy. There is a presence in the room. Maybe it's of the dignitaries, the stars of stage and film that walked its stern, or maybe just the thousands of former passengers that have stayed in the cabins that makes you feel she has something left to give. The Conservancy is hopeful that someone will come along and save her. There's no question that it will require lots of money, but it will take the right vision for the SS to achieve a rebirth. We're taking it month by month, but, but I'm encouraged. As long as we're able to save it, that's all we really want. I see this ship 
illuminated, full of people who are in awe of what she was and what she is and what she'll become. And she will endure as this remarkable expression of American history. She will just be alive. Coming up next on the Jarek Report, we'll take you to the scene, the thriving ballroom scene of Philadelphia. thriving ballroom community here in Philadelphia, which really took root about 30 years ago. It is a chance for the LGBTQ community to express themselves and express their creativity. Photojournalist Mike Greenwich caught up with an icon in ballroom here in Philly, Jason Montclair. I am Jason and I'm the icon overall mother. I've learned so much, I've seen so much, I've experienced so much, there's so many stories that I could talk about that I've seen at the corner of 13th and Locust, at the corner of, 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 of 13th and Walnut, on the, at the corner of 12th and Spruce. Like there's so much magic that is ballroom that has happened on those dark streets. What does it mean, I guess, to the queer community to have a space like, like ballroom? Ballroom was introduced during a time where like being gay now is more you know, it's more in your face, it's more you see it. It was no representation of gayness back then. We had to hide. Fast forward, you know, 50, 60 years later, ballroom is here, ballroom is loud, ballroom is in your face. You know, ballroom is a place that, you know, has been around. It's just that now everybody's like, oh, this is cool. Uh, we've been cool. Ballroom was the place that I guess you could say I finally walked into my queerness. Cause though I always knew that I was gay. I never had a closet that I came out of. I was finally able to see different queer movement, different, you know, uh, uh, color and, and, and exaggeration and, you know, and laughter and loudness, everything that, you know, I always felt on the inside that I kept contained. Talk a bit about the Philadelphia legends of ballroom, the people who inspired you. So the people that inspired me in Philadelphia ballroom, um, Man Prodigy, Renee Karan. <laughs> Renee Karan is the queen of Philadelphia. Kelly Harper and, and Carrie Mizrahi and Michi Lanvin and Alvernian Prestige and Raphael Excellence. In Philadelphia, the house of excellence was period. In my 22 years of being in ballroom, I've lost so many you know, because of the HIV AIDS epidemic, because of, you know, uh, drugs uh, and alcohol abuse, you know, and it's unfortunate that a lot of them are not here to see the fruits of their labor. But I always say people like Renee Karan, um, you know, she, she walked so that we could run and I'm running so that the ones after me can fly. Face, 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 with the People think that ballroom is extracurricular. Ballroom is not extracurricular. Ballroom is, in, it is a fabric, it's the fabric of my life. I am a legend for the butch queen face category. So that's the category that really talks about the vanity of you, you know, your skin, your teeth, the structure of your jawline, your nose, your nails, like your presentation. So with this, face is not a category, it's a lifestyle. Facials, Michael Dermabrasions, uh, 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 laser treatments and teeth whitening in the gym um, and that's just my pre-prep then getting ready getting my catsuit custom made asking um, uh, Sazowski to sponsor my crystals on my outfit like thank god I'm a makeup artist and he was able to do that you see how the, this, this money is like starting to add up but you know I, I say all that to say that that's the beauty of ballroom that's the magic of ballroom it's, it's, it's just something that we invest into and we go into and we just want the bragging rights. We want the bragging rights to say like, yeah, I just beat you at the last ball. And you know, that, that, that kind of collegiate type of sports mentality, that, 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 that's our sports game. Okay, coming up next on the Jerk Report, energy up with a former Eagle, Connor Barwin. Back everybody to the Jerk Report. Next up, a story with Connor Barwin. When Connor played with the Philadelphia Eagles, man, he had a whole lot of energy on the field. And now that he's left football, he has dedicated a majority of his life to another form of energy, solar power. He says he has a, a dual mission, to install solar panels as often as he can, and also help inner city youth create new energy in their lives. Photojournalist Dave Eitzen has his story. 
a darn miracle as far as I'm concerned. We are taking light and we are converting that light energy into electricity. Let's bring her to the house. So we're at the house of Connor Barwin, a famous Philadelphia Eagles uh, linebacker and lineman. I've been thinking about solar for a long time, where the economics now make sense. And so today, uh, they're doing the install. It's amazing, it'll power my lights, it'll power my fridge. I got a Tesla, it'll power my car. For certain days, Pico's gonna be paying me, because I'm gonna be sending so much energy back to the grid, which is what, it, what we should be doing. We need to get on board and we need to accelerate this transition to clean, green energy as fast as possible. As you look around at this work site, you'll see lots of Philadelphians here. For some people, this is the first time they've had benefits. We've been in this business for 13 years. I've literally seen it change people's lives. Welcome to the roof. Yeah. I get to be outside. And I love the sun. I love being outside, getting that vitamin D in. All right, you got the next one. I left sales. I was pulling my hair out. I want to be doing something different with my hands. And I also like to think I'm getting karma points. Every house I finish with solar, I'm like, 10 karma points for me. <laughs> the fact that you can offset 100% of your bill from solar if the conditions are right, that, that just speaks to me, especially because I grew up in a low and moderate like, income neighborhood. You live in these neighborhoods that are economically depressed and solar fills that gap. Not only are you providing green jobs, but you're giving people a chance to change their life. I did one of the training programs and I learned how to install and I've been on my way ever since. I showed up the first day, they gave me a hard hat, and they told me, get up that ladder. And I did it, you know, compete with these boys, you know, show what I can do. I've never worked with all men before, and I thought I had to be tough. I came in real brute, and I was like, hey boys, oh, forget about it, trying to be tough. And it got me the nickname, Toughy right here, because they said, like, you're fun size, and you're trying to be too tough. but. They treated me with respect. They treated me like a brother, equals, you know? And we're just one big family, and that's something I, it caught me off guard. You learn to love your work. You know you're doing good stuff. You know that your sweat and labor has gone into something that's gonna make the environment better. We can get a lot more houses with solar, then you can, you know, save the world. We talk about global warming, we talk about things that the world is changing. And I want to prolong our lives. I want my children to live a nice, fulfilled life, and their children too. I love the fact that there's real jobs getting created around this new green economy. And I'm seeing it at my house in my yard today. Well, speaking of energy, I could use your energy. If you have a story idea, contact me. Best way to get a hold of me probably is on Twitter. My handle is at MikeFox29. And we'll be right back. Well, thank you so much for being with me on this edition of the Jarek Report. By the way, you can see our stories 24 hours a day on our website, fox29.com. Just scroll down until you see the tab, the Jarek Report. And I will see you next time, and of course, on Good Day Philadelphia. <laughs>